Good morning, everyone. Uh, I want to add to my welcome, uh, Abe's welcome. Uh, thank you for coming to church. Uh, and um, yeah, let's uh, dig into God's word. There was once a woman who lived in despair. Her name is Phoebe, and she grew up knowing God and his love for her. She also gathers weekly at church with people. But Phoebe's sins were always before her. She feels like a hypocrite, like putting on a face to show that she has it all together. Phoebe has tried everything, but she still sins in the same ways. And recently, she feels like she's going on a downward spiral. What's the point of resisting if she keeps sinning? Well, fast forward a few weeks, um, Phoebe has made some progress in fighting sin, but she still stumbles sometimes. Struggling with sin has over time become a part of her life. So she's moved on to being in denial. At least she's not as bad as those other people. I mean, those people, they really need help and are some serious prayers. Well, who is Phoebe? What I actually described is me. It's different points of my Christian life. Sometimes I'm in despair about my sin, but sometimes I'm in denial. But I wonder if this is just my unique experience or whether this reminds you of yourself. Well, this morning we're going to hear from King David's experience struggling with sin. But please don't treat David as one of those really bad sinners over there if we're really honest with ourselves, we are just the same. Our sins are always before us as well. And so we really need this prayer that David teaches us. David teaches us to humbly confess our sins before God and to pray for transformation. Well, this morning we're going to see this in three headings. Uh, the first one is um, sins exposed in uh, verse zero, the um, kind of prologue. And then we'll see uh, sins confessed in verses one to nine. And then lastly, sinner transformed uh, in verses 10 to 19. So let's pray together as we come to God's word. Father of unfailing love and compassion, we know all of our sins that are always done in your sight. Both the sins that we willingly commit and the sins that are hidden. Have mercy on us. Give us a broken spirit and a contrite heart as we come to Psalm 51. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, let's have a look at the first heading, Sins Exposed. Uh, reading from the words before verse 1, uh, it's a subtitle, a subheading that's really helpful for us. So Psalm 51, for the director of music, a psalm of David, when Nathan the prophet came to him after David had committed adultery with Bathsheba. This is a reference to 2 Samuel 11 and 12, when David coveted his neighbor's wife. And not only that, he committed adultery with her and he murdered her husband. David even married Bathsheba to try to cover up his sins when she got pregnant. David was in complete denial over the evil that he'd done in the sight of God. So God sends Nathan the prophet to expose his sins. Out of God's great love for him, he sent Nathan to expose David's sins. Why is that? Well, it's because sin thrives in secrecy. And so God exposes his sins and brings it out into the light. 
It's because God loves David. But what about David's sins, though? Adultery and murder, they were both capital offences in the Old Testament, in the law. Death is the only appropriate punishment for him. But let's have a think for a second. Is it only David that deserves death for adultery and murder? What about us? I mean, a lot of us have never committed those serious sins before, right? And yet, what does Jesus teach us in the Gospels? Looking lustfully at people is committing adultery. And being angry and cursing someone, well, that's the same as murder. The New Testament teaches us that everyone who sins is a slave to sin, and the wages of sin is death. David is not one of those really bad sinners that, you know, we compare ourselves with to feel better. We're all the same. You and I also deserve death for rejecting God and living life our own way. But God doesn't leave us to die in our sins. Just like God sending Nathan to expose his sins, God exposes our sins this morning to show us how to respond. So let's have a look at how David responds in our second heading, Sins Confessed, starting in verses 1 to 2. Have a look with me in the Bible. Have mercy on me, God, according to your unfailing love, according to your great compassion, Blot out my transgressions. Wash away all my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. Well, as you can see, within the first two verses, David has confessed his sins by describing them in three different ways. He talks about his transgressions, his iniquity, and his sin. We get the feeling and the picture that David is confessing all of his sins before God. He says, my sins are always before me. And they were there from the very beginning, from the time my mother conceives me. God is a God who desires justice, in verse 4, and faithfulness, in verse 6. This is the complete opposite of what David had done. He had rebelled against the God of justice and faithfulness by doing what is evil in his sight. And so David has no excuse to bargain. He has no excuse to lighten or justify his sins before God. David is in the wrong and he desperately needs God's mercy. There is nothing he can do to fix his own sins. And ironically, that's the only thing he can do. There's only one thing he can do, to ask God to have mercy on him. For some of us, we tend to think of our Christian lives as, it's not too bad if people ask us how we're doing. You know, sometimes we're like this, um, well, we had um, people for lunch last week. Uh, sometimes we feel like we're at church on Sundays, we've made it. We're at Bible study. We serve people. We host people for lunch. And we try our best to live as a Christian at home and at work. You know, sometimes we sin against God, but we confess our sins to him and we try to do better next time. We say a quick prayer and we just move on. But if I'm honest with myself, I don't always feel the weight of my sin. I don't always feel the despair and my desperate need for God's mercy. Is that how you also feel? Why is that? Well, maybe our view of our own sin is just too small. Listen to how John Calvin from the 16th century describes sin up on the screen. We deem it sin when a person is tickled by any desire at all against the law of God. Indeed, we label sin that very depravity which begets in us desires of this sort. 
Do you see what Calvin is describing? Sin is not just when you give in to it or when you act out. Calvin would say that the sinful desires inside us is sin. That's why David says his sins are always before him in verse 3. A lot of times, we are able to resist those sinful desires in us. And that is a very good thing. Don't get me wrong. This is the work of God inside us. But at the same time, those sinful desires should remind us of our sins before God. We all have a very serious problem. And there's nothing we can do to fix ourselves. All we can do is come to our merciful God, confess our sins, and pray for his mercy. And so what does David do? He confesses his sins to the God of unfailing love, compassion, faithfulness, and justice. This is who God is. He has revealed himself to Moses in Exodus 34 by sharing this name. The Lord is compassionate, gracious, and loving, and he freely forgives sins. At the same time, though, David knows that God rightfully judges sin. He doesn't leave sins unpunished. And so David pleads for God's mercy to wash away his iniquity. He doesn't wait until he's fixed everything before he pleads God, pleads with God. It's not about what David can do. David can't do anything but rather it is about who God is. God is merciful. And so David confesses all his sins to God in his despair. If you look down in verse 7, hyssop is mentioned. Hyssop is used to cleanse with blood and water things that are unclean in the Old Testament. And so, in a similar way, David prays for his sins to be washed clean like snow. And he asks God for mercy in verse 8. David also continues to ask God to wipe away his iniquity, verse 9. So, if God can do this amazing thing for David, then he can definitely do this for us through Jesus. Jesus is the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And those who trust in Jesus will have their robes washed and made white in the blood of the Lamb. There is real and full forgiveness for our sins when Jesus died on the cross. And so because of who God is, David can freely confess his sins before God. And he can boldly ask for forgiveness. How much more can we freely confess our sins and receive full forgiveness in Jesus? And so this takes us to the second half of our psalm, where David longs for real transformation. We're on our last heading, point three, sinner transformed. Well, in this section, David prays for a lot of things. Uh, So we'll focus mainly on some repeated words uh, and his response. And so if you have a read again in the last section, uh, second half, you'll notice the words heart and spirit are repeated. They begin this section in verses 10 to 12, and they finish it in verse 17. And so let's have a look in verse 10. Create in me a pure heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Do not cast me from your presence, or take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation, and grant me a willing spirit to sustain me. And then down in verse 17, My sacrifice, O God, is a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart you, God, will not despise. Do you see what David is praying in these verses? He prays for a renewed heart and spirit. This is a prayer of renewal and transformation for his whole body, inside and outside. Why does David pray for transformation and renewal? 
Well, I think the passage gives us two reasons. If you have a look in verse 11, the first reason is because sin separates him from relationship with God. And so David prays and pleads for God's spirit to remain on him despite his sins and God's punishment. The second reason is in verse 17, because David has humbled himself before God with sorrow, regret, and repentance. His spirit and heart are broken before God. There's nothing he can do to fix this problem, to fix his own sin. The only thing he can do is to come humbly before God. And if we have a look in verse 16, David seems to say that this is the only sacrifice that pleases God. His humility before God. And so David humbly prays for a renewed heart and spirit. When we pray and confess to God, we should do so with humility and sorrow over our own sins. Remember the words of Jesus in Luke 18 when he compares the tax collector with the Pharisee. Jesus says the tax collector who begged God for mercy went home justified before God because those who humble themselves will be exalted. And thankfully for us, the spirit won't be taken away if we trust Jesus. And so we have all the more reason to come to God with humility and pray for a renewed heart and spirit. Well, besides doing this, uh, David also prays for the joy of salvation in verse 12. When we are faced with the depths of our sin, we can end with despair, guilt, and shame. It's easy that we can see David had those feelings in this psalm. Or sometimes, unlike David, we might feel something else. Instead of feeling despair, sometimes we feel that God will forgive our sins anyway through Jesus. I mean, after all, isn't that what the New Testament teaches us? That anyone who believes in Jesus' death and resurrection, they'll receive forgiveness because Jesus died for their sins once for all. So sometimes over time, our salvation can feel bland. It's like having rice every day, you know, 24-7, 365 days a year. Seriously, when I first moved out of my own house, sorry, of my family's house, um, the first thing I did was to stop having rice with every meal. It just became boring and common. Even though rice is like the source of life in Asia and it's the foundation of society. And so, for David, who is in despair, how can he get his joy of salvation back? For us, if we're feeling bland, how can we get it back? Well, it's actually by knowing what we have been saved from and the one who is able to save us. As we grow to understand and confess the depths of our sinfulness, We will grow to love our Saviour more and more. He who died and rose in our place. This is a diagram to reflect this. And uh, it's one that I learnt in uni ministry. Um, The goal and prayer is that as we understand the depths of our sin, we will grow to see the joy of salvation. Because the cross is bigger. And bigger. And so let us pray that God will expose the utter depths of our sin so that we can grow in our joy of salvation. And if David can rejoice over God's salvation and forgiveness, we have more the, all the more reason to rejoice in Jesus. So after praying for the joy of salvation, David responds in two ways. He teaches sinners to repent in verse 13, and he prays for the welfare of God's people as their king in the last two verses. For us, it's easy to see 
how David can teach sinners to repent because, well, after all, David sinned and he repented. But if David is the king of Israel who points us to Jesus, how does Jesus teach us to repent? Jesus has never sinned before. Well, this is where the book of Hebrews has some helpful insights for us. Even though Jesus had never sinned, he has been tempted in every way like us. Jesus understands our sinful struggles and he even faced the consequence of death for us. And so in Hebrews 2, we read that Jesus is able to help those who are being tempted. Jesus is a great example for us in how we can help each other in our struggle against sin. At many points in my own life, I've always wondered why I struggle with my particular sins. But God has helped me to know and to see that in my struggle, I can help those who are similar to me. I know how it feels. I know how to keep persevering and fighting against sin. And so as God grew my awareness and confession of my sin, he has helped me to break out of denial and to seek help, to not just fight individually, because our fight against sin is not an individual fight. And so we've got to help each other and we've got to teach sinners like us to repent, to turn back to God and to find his forgiveness and his compassion. I think this is what David and Jesus had in mind. To teach sinners the depths of their sin, to model humble confession, and to show them how to pray. So David teaches us in this psalm to humbly confess our sins before God and to pray for transformation. Let me finish with um, four takeaways for us. The first is that God exposes our sin because he loves us. So please, don't let sin thrive in secrecy. Bring it out into the light. And secondly, please fight against comparisons that we might have with other worse sinners. There is no such thing as worse sinners. We all deserve death for rejecting God and living life our own way. And so pray that God will show us the depths of our sin so that we can confess them to our merciful Father. And because of God's mercy, he will completely forgive us through Jesus' death and resurrection. Thirdly, pray for renewal and pray for joy of salvation. One thing I started doing recently is to confess my sins every time I feel tempted by my sinful desires. It's only when I see how sinful I am that I can grow to love God more and to grow to love the joy of salvation. And lastly, let's confess, let's confess our sins to one another. Let's help each other here at Auburn Church to repent and to find full forgiveness in Jesus. Let's pray. Father of mercy and faithfulness, grow in us a deeper and deeper.